Good evening, everybody. What's happening? It is Thursday, February 3rd, 2022. As you can see, I am joined by Gary and my now co-host, the good fun guy. Now, before we get started, if you've never seen a 90-second Mycology live stream before, I've got, a playlist. I've got a playlist on this channel that has all of the live streams set up. Everybody, Whoa. what's happening? It is... Hold on. Oops, I got that. I have a live stream playlist it's Thursday, on this channel. Thursday, February 3rd. I got the audio coming through. Hold on. 3rd, 2022. As you can see, I am joined. Technical difficulties. Hold on. I'm getting feedback from the live stream. By Gary and my now co-host. Huh. Is it getting picked up? On Hold stream? on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. There we go. We should be good now. Okay, anyway, so I'm joined here by the good fun guy, my co-host. We have Gary on the channel. Before we get started, if you've never seen a live stream before, a 90-second Mycology live stream, I've got a playlist on this channel that has all of the live streams set up for you, so if you want to go back and watch them, or if you are late to this one, you can always go find the playlist and watch the other live streams. Um, always comments about the face diaper, people call it. That's explained for you. Might do a face review later. So everybody who's here with me, Gary, the good fun guy, and myself, all of our links are down in the description of this video. Everything from official websites, the good fun guy has merch, Gary has his Etsy, Etsy shop down there, and Gary has a TikTok, if you didn't know, that link is also down there. So Gary, it's an honor to have you on the channel. I know the good fun guy reached out to you. And like you said, it's just good to, to bring the community together and, and all just hang out. So tell us a little bit about yourself and for people who don't know about your YouTube channel and the Fresh from the Farm Fungi branding that you have. Yeah, um, I just want to start out by saying thank you for inviting me on to this chat. Um, I'm super excited and being a fellow YouTuber, I definitely see your guys' videos and, you know, I love meeting other youtubers in the community i feel like we're providing you know some value and service to all the mushroom family out there and i just appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to um just talk mushrooms i could talk mushrooms all day so i guess um one one disclaimer that i'll say is that um i i say auger a little bit different than most people <laughs> and that kind of comes from my background so yeah. I'll start off there. So it's a I'm professional Buffalo, background. New York. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm from Buffalo, New York. Um, it's upstate New York. So I'm pretty much Canadian, like right by Niagara Falls. And that's where my accent comes from, if I have one. Um, but I uh, I went to college at the University of Buffalo and I studied medical laboratory technology. So my background in mycology actually is from a clinical mycology point of view. I took a couple years of, of clinical mycology where we studied uh, pathogenic fungi and different, um, you know, uh, like food safety and whatnot. So my interest kind of began back then, at, at least with the, the life cycle of fungi, fungi and working on agar and identification and microscopy. Um, so after I graduated college, um, I, I went on a cross country adventure with my wife um, and we explored the whole country in my Jeep Wrangler. And we did that for a couple months and kind of decided on Colorado after staying at Glenwood Springs for a few days, we just fell in love with the area um, I was working at a blood bank at the time, so we were testing um, different blood for compatibility for surgeries and whatnot. So I really learned about aseptic technique and all the laboratory procedures. Um, and then when we moved out here, I accepted a job at a tissue culture procurement um, company in Centennial. It's called Allosource. So we made human tissue products out of different um, stem cells and stem cell progenitors and different um, aloe, aloe tissue. So I worked on a weekend shift 
um, 12 hour shifts and we had to wear like the full space suits and the BSL three lab. And it was really cool experience to be in that type of environment, like all the procedures we had to follow and it was very high standards of cleanliness. So I feel like that kind of established my, my baseline as far as aseptic technique and um, understanding flow hoods and really like the science portion, which I'm really, you know, that's my passion is working in the lab and kind of developing strains and stuff. So after a couple years of working there, um, my, my boss took another job in California and our whole department got kind of shifted around because of different regulations at the time. So I decided to um, leave that venture and then I, I joined the cannabis industry, which it just became legal for recreation at that time. So I started a project um, with one of the largest um, cannabis growers here in Denver, and we bred over 80 different strains. Um, so we used tissue culture techniques like plant tissue culture, which is very similar to um, like uh, tissue culture in mycology. Uh, there's different hormones and stuff in the agar, but other than that, it, it developed um, my techniques for mushroom cultivation. And at the same time, I, I bought a house over in Aurora, and I've always been an avid gardener. So I just remember seeing Paul Stamitz's video about how mushrooms could save the world, and um, I started to attempt a mushroom patch in my backyard in my garden. Um, so I ordered like a little package of spawn from Amazon and it was probably from China. It came in like this tiny little pouch and it had like 12 oat kernels that were all dried out, but, um, I didn't know what I was doing really. So I just put it into a tote and waited for something to happen. And I waited for like three weeks and then finally there was a, a little bit of growth on the surface. So I was super excited, but in like two days, it just turned green and just got ripped apart with trichoderma. So that was my first ever attempt at growing mushrooms. And that was probably a seven years ago um, or six and a half years ago. And then ever since then, I've just been interested in um, kind of establishing a better system. So I, I was cultivating my own cannabis and it's legal here in um, Colorado. So I had like a, a hydroponic tent and a lot of the equipment necessary. And being in a lab, um, I also collected a lot of old lab equipment and kind of just had a bunch of stuff in my basement, like an incubator, uh, autoclave, and a bunch of glassware. And then one day I, I invested in a flow hood. So I guess that was the, the birthing of my company. So I started growing lion's mane and like a little four by four tent. And one day I, I posted some ads on Craigslist and someone actually rode their bike all the way from Lakewood to my house in Denver. And they bought all the lion's mane. And I remember them um, vividly. So I had like this brown bag filled with the lion's mane and he grabbed it and he took one of the fruiting bodies and just ate it like an apple. So I was like, oh, my God, dude, like, <laughs> you got to cook it first. But he lived. Um, and then at that moment, I decided that, you know, I had a viable product and I started to sell it to my friends and family and just on Craigslist, like some people in the neighborhood. And probably, you know, that was like maybe June or July four years ago. And it took about six or seven months for me to run into um, the owner of the co-op at first. Um, so it's a, like a little artisan grocery store in Denver. Her name is Christina, and she reached out to me. I don't know, maybe, I think she saw like an ad on Nextdoor, and um, she wanted me to provide mushrooms to their co-op. So that was kind of the point, the turning point for my production. So I really got to test like, um, how many mushrooms I could grow and it started to take off and then that summer I got into the farmer's market at Cherry Creek 
um, farmer's market in Denver. So I was growing lion's mane, king oyster, blue oyster, um, an Italian brown oyster. I think that was it for the first year. So a few varieties. And then as I started to um, get some success with that, I just reinvested into my lab and um, just kept growing from there. And then this year, we just recently uh, purchased this property in Sedalia. So um, it's about 30 minutes south of Denver. And I just got the permits um, approved for building a Quonset. So we're going to be building a warehouse on the property and just keep expanding our operations from there. So that's kind of uh, my background, um, how I got to where I'm at today. And then I guess for me, YouTube is kind of my hobby. Like I just love the community and um, just the people, you know, on in the mycology world are so open to sharing and very supportive, which is nice. So I feel like I'm not just locked in my basement all day, you know, talking to the mushroom mycelium. <laughs> But yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at. And um, I'm excited to, you know, begin this next year. I'm currently in a pretty extensive breeding project that I'm doing. So if you haven't seen my video series for this year, it's called Immaculate Inoculation. So I, I, I name, inoculated. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> I inoculated a bunch of spores on um, Christmas Eve. And I'm currently sitting on probably 14 or 15 different phenotypes um, on grain. And then I'm waiting for the rest of them to catch up before I put everything into um, bulk production. And then I'm going to do my selections. And then this um, summer is going to be very tricky because we do have our, our operation in Denver that's still going. And then in the meantime, we're going to be building out our new facility in Sedalia. So a lot of big changes and I'm just excited for, you know, the the advancement of our production and just the opportunity to kind of tweak our system and really invest heavily into, you know, really efficient production. That's kind of my goal. Yeah, I like the project so, you, you've got going on is uh like you none of it is really at the microscopic level like you're just kind of looking at the mycelium on the plates you're going like well this is thinner so it might just be a haploid of mycelium and then you're transferring the single haploids over and then you're going to cross those to make them into diploids i think that's really cool because it's just with the visual eye you know the naked eye nothing really at the microscopic level yeah totally so i i have done quite a bit of microscopy in the past, but it gets pretty tedious and it's very subjective in my opinion. So a lot of people talk about, you know, clamp, clamp connections and some species. And yeah. for me, my personal experience is like, so I did a lot of clinical microbiology and sometimes when you're looking for something, you just plant that in your brain and then everything looks like that. And it was kind of, you know, frustrating for me as a, a new student working out very subjective you know images all the time so it kind of pushed my my direction of thinking into like a macroscopic level but I'm definitely interested in the, the microscopy side of things I just think that it can be done without that tool and there's ways to prove otherwise but I think adding microscopy to the toolkit would be beneficial, but yeah, that's kind of, I guess I, I'm just uh, a little off put from the early days and um, you know, it takes a lot of, a lot of time and dedication to really get good at yeah. microscopy in general. Yeah. Next thing you know, you've got like a hundred plates stacked up in the, in the lab because it just transfers everywhere. Yep. Only so yep. That's a, uh, that's definitely, you know, always on the mind. Is mushrooms never stop growing. So, you know, there's some tricks you can you can refrigerate it um, to slow it down. But I I have a pretty good cycle as far as my transfers go. I do my slants every six months, and then my I do 
kind of like plates, liquid culture, and then QC the liquid culture on plates. And then that's kind of my production. And then having the backup liquid culture, the backup Petri dish for production, going between those is a good cycle. And then having the slants as my backup mother cultures, that's kind of how I handle that workflow. But it definitely gets overwhelming when I throw in, you know, some new breeding projects, which I try to get done as quick as possible to select, you know, the top four or five out of that so I can kind of cut out the, the rest of them that aren't as strong. Are the majority of your liquid cultures going up in your shop? Yeah, yeah. So if you check out our shop, um, Fresh Fungi on Etsy, we have... I don't know, like 20 something different varieties. I'm going to be putting the newest phenotypes up there as soon as we get them. I already have them in liquid culture. So that's, you know, ready to go. I just haven't selected them for fruiting yet. But um, yeah, as far as Etsy goes, um, I feel like the most important thing is to do quality control. So I like to m ensure sterility. And even if that means holding back, you know, a big flask of liquid culture, I do my due diligence to test every single batch. And that's why maybe sometimes my, my cultures are sold out because they're in high demand, but I'm definitely trying to, um, you know, have the best product without any contaminants so you and... started them all from spore right like you start from spore find the best phenotype and you make it your own and people know the branding of fresh from the farm fungi is going to produce great fruits you get the thick lines main the piopino oysters when it's when it comes from fresh fungi on etsy they know it's quality absolutely so i would say Probably like 65 to 70 percent are from spore. Um, some of them are just cultures that I, I got from trading. Um, some of them were donated from my mentor. So there was a my dad's friend from work. Um, her husband grew mushrooms for about 12 years in <laughs> Niagara Falls, New York. Um, so one Thanksgiving, I went down there, visited his farm, and he kind of taught me how to scale production early on. And he ended up giving me a strain of lion's mane from Niagara Falls. Um, that's definitely the, the one that I use in my production. And then also the king oyster mushroom was from him. Um, and then there's another strain the Italian oyster that I'm using as a progenitor for these breeding projects that I found on Craigslist. Um, my wife actually found it. So it was just a, an abandoned bag on someone's porch and I cloned that mushroom. So those were like my first three strains that I was growing. And then from there on, I, I introduced the breeding and kind of refined all of those strains and, um, but I do still have some some strains that are just cloned um, that are just really rigorous. But I've been working on kind of crossbreeding and bringing in new phenotypes. And yeah, it's just a constant improvement, you know, one step at a time. And I feel like in the long term, that is going to pay dividends. I've already increased my yields from the first year I was getting 0 0.7, 0 0.8 pound flushes off of five pound blocks and all since then you know my average has gone up probably to about 1.2 1.5 pounds off the first flush no so, i saw somewhere me, you said you're running oats you're running oats right now because you just have them available and then are you running yep. just a standard soy soy hull and hardwood substrate yep, yeah so I, yep i do the masters mix it's a 50 50 soy hull and yeah. um oak and uh shout out to uh mushroom media so if you guys know yeah. seth he, we all he use that. hooked me up with the pellets and ever since then it's been a game changer yeah and, um, i think i have a code uh fff happy five and it's five percent off so uh, yeah 
Like, nice though. Yeah, mushroom media is great yeah, stuff. He's got good, good stuff. I want some pellets for like cocoa core and vermiculite so that I don't have to like. Yes, I've been pushing for some some yeah. cocoa hemp pellets or like cocoa yeah. straw. Absolutely. Definitely. Well, you know, I you can get the there's discs. There's a market for it. Like little cocoa you... discs that uh, they sell them, you know, like little mesh things for seed germination. And it's like, yep. if you could do that just without the little mesh piece on it, because it'll expand in the mesh and make a little cocoa, uh, you know, a little cocoa seed starter cylinder that they sell. Like the little jiffy, the jiffy containers. That's what I'm trying to say. The peat yep. and cocoa. Yeah. Yeah, and imagine yeah, that. I, Everything you need in a Something pellet. that could fit in one of those baggers, even though I just hand scoop right now. So, yeah, I, I think that the hydration of the pellets is definitely what led to some bigger yields, just the, their water holding capacity. So prior to using pellets, I was working with a few different woodworkers and I'd create my own blends with like little fine particles from a sander. And then there's this machine called a wood whiz, which is like a CNC machine. And it made these little like half curls. Um, so I was blending that. And then also with a wood planer, which creates like little spirals. So it had all these different forms in the matrix of the media. And that worked really well. And it was mm. cool because I could choose like a cherry blend. And I, I definitely noticed different flavor profiles in the mushrooms. So it was a lot like more crafty than just growing on pellets. But I feel like when you can manipulate your own genetics, then you almost want to move towards more yield than, you know, procuring the, the different substrates. But I think there is definitely a place for that. And maybe in the future I can have like a more like broad based production. And then I would love, love to go back to like pro procuring like super refined um, bulk substrates for, different mushroom flavor oh, yeah. profiles and you already have think, you know you got a system that's working you're producing pounds already you might as well stick with it until yeah. you until you you can that's experiment later but see that's kind of the interesting thing too that we were discussing last night on discord was i mean even the best understanding of cultivation for mushrooms seems to be generally limited to what's worked what has worked best in the past and I feel like a lot of pullback and hesitation towards, I don't want to say necessarily reinventing the wheel, but um, to some degree reapproaching, um, pardon me, just how we look at um, cultivating mushrooms on, oh, geez, sorry, I answered my phone on accident, but, <laughs> but just kind of how we look at um, approach cultivating on a scale. I mean, it, we hadn't, if I hadn't heard you would use cocoa core or vermiculite and gypsum for cubes in general. Like, I'm not sure that would have been my starting point of materials to want to use to try to reproduce them. However, given that it seems to work quite well, my like initiative to deviate from that is pretty limited. And so like, you can apply the same like kind of concept to gourmets in the sense of we found that like soybean hole and I guess there's a sort of limitation with the gourmet towards needing like a readily available um, waste product. But as far as their ability to adapt to environment, how once like our ability to control them to accomplish what we think we want out of them is still generally limited. Like if we, for example, if we say we want to convert this wasted like coffee, coffee grains into, you know, convertible organic material for humans into food, we can do that. But what efficiency are we doing that? And like, how well do we really understand the process versus how well are we just integrating a recipe and allowing the cake to kind of bake itself in a way? I mean, I think about that with like, some of the tubs that I've had. It's like I've treated two identically the same way and had completely different results. But the amount of variables, I think, are ultimately where we get skewed. And like the ones that we think are important, they're somehow misleading because we're approaching it from sometimes the wrong perspective but if it if it yields a good enough result it seems that we're not interested enough in kind of redesigning it i don't know we were talking about it last night there's a lot of different ways to approach growing mushrooms and there's a, a lot of ways to succeed at growing mushrooms but kind of what the future holds for it and how to make it viable enough that everybody isn't so mycophobic within the community like by spreading knowledge how it kind of breaks down 
barriers amongst different communities. I mean, it was. Yeah, I brought that up before. Like sometimes people have interesting ideas and they go to a forum like Shroomery or Reddit. They go, do you think I could do this? Somebody says, no, you can't. And they go, okay. And they never try it. And who knows what the world may have lost because of it in a sense, but like because somebody was willing to try cocoa core and vermiculite or hardwood and soybean whole substrate, we have found that to be an effective mix. However, like you, like we were saying last night as well, I think this was, it was one of you two, feel free to claim it, but you don't see <laughs> trees out there mixing grains. and. Oh yeah, that was, that was me. Um, like, yeah, that was steroids. one of the topics I wanted to bring up. Like, what if, like Gary, what are your thoughts on liquid culture and agar directly to a bulk substrate? Because the the original PF Tech brown rice flour and vermiculite, there's no grain, but I get it. The brown rice flour is ground up grain. However, there aren't any actual like grain anchors, little moisture reservoirs. So we supplement it with that vermiculite to hold the moisture. So what mm -hmm. if somehow we completely eliminated grain? and you get the same production value. Like, have you ever run any experiments, LC or agar directly to a substrate as a commercial yeah, grower, so, you know? Yeah, so, so I, I definitely have tried this before and I'll kind of describe my thoughts. So it definitely works um, as far as going from grain to a bulk substrate or even agar wedge to a bulk substrate. Yeah. Um, I think the diff just difference between those two right off the bat is going to be inoculation points so i would prefer liquid culture because it's going to spread through the substrate faster um but so for me from a cult uh commercial cultivating perspective um real estate is extremely valuable so the benefit of going that half step into a, a tiny like pint-sized grain jar or even yeah. a five pound bag of grain that can inoculate, you know, 10 or 20 bags is that it's not taking up real estate space with uncolonized substrate. So I did do, you know, a full rack of liquid cultures. And then the next day I did another rack of liquid cultures. And then the next day I did another one. And very quickly, my whole incubation was filled with partially colonized fruiting blocks where if I had gone the same amount of work time effort into five pound grain bags, then maybe only one shelf would have been grain and one shelf would have been bulk substrate. So it, it kind of speeds up the, the volume gap instead of, you know, having these tiny little inoculations and a large amount of sterile substrate in your incubation, you're, yeah you know, consolidating space. So that's, that was the limitation from my, my operations, but maybe you live in like the middle of nowhere in Kansas and real estate is less expensive than bulk substrate. So then it might make sense to do that. Um, but here in Denver, you know, space is limited and I would much rather use the incubation space for fruiting mushrooms, which is more valuable. And generally speaking, indoors, I mean, it's all going to be climate controlled space too. It's not just space anywhere you go, because if so, if we're just considering like outdoor real estate, there may be some climates that are more suited for cultivating outdoors. And I think this is something that is interesting. You don't see us growing many plants commercially indoors just because the viability of like I think the sunlight is like the main like expenditure that you'd have to put into plants indoors as well as like the controlled environment. But since they do it well outside, we tend to prefer that. But with mushrooms, like since they don't need light, I feel like we favor doing it indoors. Whereas outdoors, if we could do it effectively commercially, there may be like a far greater reduction in costs. But I think the issue tends to be like the shelf life with them, like turning over so quickly outdoors and all of the other <laughs> pests that want to kind of come and get them. And yeah. so like along the lines of what 90 just brought up, like going from liquid culture or agar directly to substrate and ditching the grains. What if you ditched the grains and the substrate altogether and just kind of went straight off of the agar? If there was some way to bounce between recipes of agars 
and then fruit from one agar to the next in a kind of commercially viable way. That way, your real estate space isn't taken up for so long you're, if your turnover time is quicker. So like if your shelves are only occupied for half the time now, your, your space just got twice as valuable in a sense. And so there was an effective way because I don't know if I saw it on your channel or not, or we talked about this, but the cordyceps, like fruiting mm -hmm. agar, direct cordyceps directly off of agar is a pretty common technique. And you've been working, working on it. Correct me. Where yeah. I'm so right. yeah, um, I think that the downside of fruiting off of agar is that the surface area is going to be much less. So that kind of limits your pin sets. So my thoughts were, if you could either like smash up the the agar and create more surface area, or if you could create little auger beads that simulated the shapes of grains, maybe then it would have the surface area for the mycelium to strengthen itself and have the airflow for more pin sets. Um, I think that that could be a viable option. However, the sterility mm -hmm. of a, of a like auger production is going to be much more rigorous than yeah, once you cut open that fruiting bag it's mm. not aseptic anymore so then your investment is going to be into you know controlling those contaminants and if you have a a large volume of production that's very liable to contamination you're going to have to have like a very high standards in the facility i'm not trying to say it's going to be impossible but it would almost go from being like how do you really you know see it would go from like a large like manual labor operation to like a very delicate aseptic technique and procedural driven operation totally and so i, I don't know i'm like a stream of consciousness perhaps there's some sort of medium between you know the sterility of substrate and grains to the sterility of agar perhaps mm -hmm. being like a less like rich media or perhaps a more aggressive strain of mycelium that's more capable of overtaking contamination when it has the benefit of um i guess a competitive advantage like when you have so many like different inoculation points for it to grab a hold of but i think the like nutrition density of agar is what i've been no noticing like for example so like this cup right here is not the best example of it this is an earlier one that i'm playing around with but you see how thin that line of agar is the amount of like surface area that it takes up on kind of a flat x and y axis is relatively small but if you were to have kind of a 3d encompassed area of agar where that nutrition is being fully utilized in order to produce a pin set like that pin relative to the size of this agar is pretty good mm -hmm. there hasn't really been anything done to induce it and so if there was some intentional effort put in to getting it to do this type of pinning and fruiting directly from agar and perhaps like training it over generations to because I feel like it wants to succeed in a way and that it'll pursue patterns that like generally promote success. So if you like let it succeed over generations on agar fruiting this way by like either taking clones of pins or whatever the means is, I just put this idea out there because everybody that's watching this right now, right now can be kind of one of those inoculation points of this information for however it may be used and whatever breakthrough may come of it. Like I know that like, whatever experiments I run with it will be incredibly limited to kind of my perspective and my observation because you brought it up earlier. And it's a really good point that people have an, like a tendency to want to validate their own information. Like, and there's just so many of those correlations behind not only how we grow mushrooms, but how the mushrooms grow themselves and the observations we make about them teach us a lot about ourselves and like us as growers and why we assume the things that we do. Like, I don't know. It's like we pass on these judgments to <laughs> mushrooms in little subtle ways that we do to people in the same way that when we're able to reproach it from a growing standpoint and remove those, like it's almost like an, like an empathetic learning experience by like not putting yourself in the shoes of the mushrooms, but in a sense, like trying to see what it is that they need best and how to meet those needs. And it seems to be one of those things in life when you pursue that with relationships that like that tends to promote like, <laughs> flourishing results but i'm gonna get off tangent here so yeah gary did you yeah. ever actually bring the those experiments to fruiting like the liquid culture to the substrate 
Did you actually get it to fruit? Like produce any yield, even though it took a while? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they definitely pr- produce mushrooms. Um, one problem that I noticed was that I hydrated my bulk substrate the same. So when I was introducing liquid cultures, I bought like these really big, it, they're like 50 mil syringes. And I was oh, doing yeah. <laughs> my inoculations with that. And eventually it would pool at the bottom. So there's a little bit of um, hydration issues, but you could just put less water in first. And the, I just, I didn't dive super deep, but I did get fruits and, you know, they were comparable yields. But like I said, the biggest problem was the the real estate just didn't make sense. I had this backlog of bags. In yeah, they were taking small, so long. Small space. Yep. So what it if was we less diced cons- up? If you dice up pieces of agar to make like little colonized inoculation points, like, and then that goes yep. along with what fungi was saying, train the mushrooms to fruit just from agar, combine it with some substrate, and then eventually move it to just pinning off of a plate. And I was thinking, I don't know, maybe our kind of way of storing agar, because like, you think about, I don't know, I like, um, what's it called? Millet, in a sense, is a grain because it's so, like, nutrient dense. Like, they're so small that they fit into, like, a lot tighter of a space. And so the same thing with agar. If you just had a block of agar in a bag that you pressure cooked and then inoculated and were able to get all of that agar pretty well colonized, like, by the mycelium in a clean environment, then using that to go to a fruiting chamber or vice versa. Like maybe you have a fruiting chamber that you pour the agar into and then allow the liquid culture to go into. I don't know. They're, I'm trying to figure out, like it's still in the process and there's lots of experiments along the way. I just put it out here now because there's a lot more minds that may put it to better use now than just me sitting on it in the lab. But yeah, I mean, agar is just fun in general. Like, Yeah, I would, uh, I would love to run the numbers, you know, just to see yield per plate and the viability of scaling that versus like you know the price of auger is pretty expensive um what what would the yields look like from a business perspective i think it could you know it could be a viable option Um, i guess it depends on like the overall final product as well because like if you're just searching for an alkaloid within a mushroom like maybe there's a liquid culture that contains that active alkaloid and instead of agar you go into a liquid media where it's just able to kind of be able to cultivate yep. faster. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely the bioreactor, you know, approach as well, where that mycelium doesn't even see light. You're just extracting the, the alkaloids from the, the media at that point. And then it gets more into like chemistry, I think. But a lot of like the, the trials that are going on at Johns Hopkins, um, those trials are not even using like the psilocybin um, studies that are happening, like the clinical trials. They're not even using mushrooms for that. They're just growing. I believe they're using yeast, like bio um, engineered yeast to produce the alkaloid. So it's not even actual mushroom, which I think that there might be benefit to using fruiting bodies as opposed to just an isolated compound because you know there's other other compounds in there that just like cannabis there could be an entourage effect or other you know compounds like like the cbd to thc or even variants of thc that they're discovering now i feel like there's so much value that could be unlocked and it's a good thing that they're moving in the direction that they're taking these you know chemicals and medicines seriously but i think that the yeah i think that the most efficient way would be to use some kind of bioreactor and just extract the alkaloids but i think that from a consumer perspective you might not be getting the full value it's like the, That's kind of fr- the fruiting body supplements compared to just having the myceliated grain that they grind up and put into a pill. You want to get mm-hmm. the full fruiting body with all the alkal- alkaloids in it. That's See, like the people a- who commercially breed cordyceps, they, they fruit it right off of like what brown rice in a jar. If you look up 
you know, if you watch mm-hmm. those videos, they don't even mm-hmm. take cordyceps really to a substrate. It's just right off the grain. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I've grown it on various grains. I, I like rice the best because of the water retention, but I also did bird seed before. Um, and I think it would be very possible to do it either off of agar or even a liquid culture if there's like some way to form a nice mat and do like a tray of liquid culture you could probably fruit cordyceps that's my my intuition um so that might be something worth you know investigating and then maybe some of the byproducts like the exudates would also be medicinal that you know normally they're extracting some things from the rice but you don't really know what they are i think that the chemistry side of the industry is is lagging behind the production side because right yeah. now we're, we're producing so many you know really cool looking cordyceps mushrooms but i can't find one lab that i can send my samples in and get an evaluation of cordycepin i've sent yeah that's you know, true four four or five samples out to different labs all across the country. And every time I just get ghosted. So if anyone's <laughs> out there who can give me some results, I'm interested. But oh, it's um, just, uh, there was a, yeah. there's a group chat. Um, are you familiar with the psilocybin tribesmen like on Instagram? We're in a group chat nope. and I forgot. Um, somebody shared um, a lab source, but I don't know if it was just for, psychoactive mushrooms or Mm. if they can also test like cordyceps but yeah you can reach out to tyson if you go uh, psilocybintribesman.com a lot of us he has a lot of our uh youtube channels and resources on his website and maybe we can get you in there too it's another it's another little community there's communities all over of mushroom guys and girls like go mushroomer yeah, I would love to test different compounds, even like uh, ricinones and, and lion's mane and even just like flavonoids. Like maybe there's these weird like terpenes that are in like a golden oyster that no one even knows are there. And that's contributing to the really, you know, vibrant flavors or something. And then that way you can like scientifically try to hone in your strains more than just like just a subjective opinion an extracted version of flavor that you kind of like yeah that would be cool too they're definitely doing that with shiitake mushrooms and shiitake mycelium um that shiitake has a lot of natural msg so that umami flavor Uh and i feel like breeding shiitakes for that would be cool too oh absolutely and it's like too maybe there's some sort of potential down the road for us to have these different beneficial, um, I want to say effects, but like different subcategories of effects within these mushrooms where we're able to say, okay, one of these is super prolific. One of these is really good at helping with eyesight. One of these is really good at helping with cancer patients. Let's isolate those different aspects of each one and breed them into one kind of mega strain. But like your, your response to that last night was, perhaps you get these really beneficial effects in one area, but you negate these other areas that end up being detrimental down the road. And you come in to find out, yeah, in a climate, suddenly this doesn't, in cold climate, this one after two generations is toast, you know, like something that is really easy to overlook because there's such an immense amount of variables, which kind of led me down the process of, okay, if there's so many variables, then the reason why mycelium has had such success up to this point, like, throughout history has been through proliferation. How do we use that to our advantage? And kind of like my big experiment that I'm curious about right now that I haven't seen done a lot of ways, but I'm sure it's been done because it's so simple. You just take two clean like versions of either spore syringes, spore, uh, spore swabs, like assuming that the spores are in a relatively clean environment and send them directly to a liquid culture. And you take different variants, mix them into a liquid culture And because of the 3D matrix of it, it's allowed to have so many different combinations envelop. And then through that, maybe we run those macro combinations in a way that says, 
okay, visually, look, this is new. Like this is different than what we've seen before. This combination happened to work out because there were billions of chances of one of them turning out this way as perhaps like the reason why cordyceps will fruit on brown rice or agar is due to the fact that one of those combinations happened to have a proclivity for it. And somebody throughout history just stumbled upon it and then recommended that as advice for doing it in the future had, you know, so it's, it's, it's such a, one of these one-off things that I feel like and has such a potential to change all of our lives, like by being a part of, and I don't know, it's, it's exciting just from a, from a hobbyist, like cultivator perspective of what can be done even on a small scale because of the proliferation of them. And I don't know. We have to just start, it's, start doing the experiments, get it going, get the LC, get the agar going, mm -hmm. put some substrate on yep. it. Give it, give it fresh air. This call is about to end though. So we might want to take a break and restart. Oh it yeah. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's take a quick break. And, um, yeah, check out a uh, hyper breeding on YouTube because that is what you're describing. I did a whole video on that. Yeah, let's talk more about that when we come back. All right, let's do it. So are we jumping to the new link? Then?
90 Second Mycology donations are now live. Head to 90secondmycology.com slash donate and you'll find the donate button here with some more information. Donation transactions are secure with PayPal. You can donate any amount that you see fit. And when you donate, you're able to leave an optional message with your name and home address for future physical thank you gifts from 90 Second Mycology. Suggested donation messages include video ideas, things you'd like to see on the channel, general comments, and anything else. If your comments and ideas are used on screen with 90 Second Mycology, you most definitely will receive a nice shout out. And we are back. So, uh, good fun guy was just saying he might do a random giveaway just out of nowhere. So, if you're here right now, you might be involved with that. Does it slam around in there though? It like it's completely snug. Oh. A little extra material to keep it safe, but Oh whoops, um. sorry. Yeah, we didn't have audio. Sorry. Uh good um, fun guy was was <laughs> he was saying that he 3D printed a petri dish holder. 3D printed. 3D printed petri dish holder with a random petri dish inside of it so the reason why i printed this was just mainly i had shipped a petri dish and it had gotten broken in the mail i was like that's a big bummer like i wonder if there's some way to kind of preserve it and so this little box is just a cool little little dish holder i was like it'd be neat if you could just go to the store and pick up like a new culture like a new piece of genetics and a little holder and it had like like a Pokemon card, but it had the strain information on the back of it and <laughs> all that jazz. But um, no, just prototyping stuff. So we'll pull somebody from the comment section here in a bit. And um, yeah, let me figure out how to get it set up real quick. And Yeah. So we were going to talk more about breeding. Uh, what I what I was saying earlier, like Gary, how you're doing your breeding just straight with the naked eye on agar and uh, the immaculate the inoculation series you have going on for people who maybe missed it earlier. We were talking about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So I can kind of just do a overview starting all the way back from spore. So, all right, there are, you know, a dozen ways that you could potentially breed mushrooms. So I would say one of the easiest ways is just to have a high concentration of spores and either putting them onto agar and then letting them all breed within each other and creating like a big mass and then taking sectors out of that. So that's one way. Um, you can take it a step further and separate out your spores. And so, so you can think of agar as a, a two-dimensional filter. So instead of going, growing up, down, left, right, you're taking those spores and you're already just putting them into two dimensions. So you can take them and start to dilute the spores. And what that would do is it would allow you to isolate a single spore, um, which contains half the genetics that a mushroom needs to fruit. Yeah. So you can either dilute the spores. What's up? The monokaryotic mycelium that the single spore spits out yep yeah so when you just take a high concentration of spores put them onto an agar dish if you took a microscope and watch the spores germinate so once they're on a, a viable service they'll form a hyphae and then two hyphaes will meet if they're compatible they will exchange genetic information um but if you wanted to be more systematic about breeding then you're going to have to be able to isolate those spores 
So you can do that physically with a microscope. So you can take, you know, a, a, a dissection scope and then it'd probably have to go, you know, 100x maybe um, to be able to isolate a single spore, like visually, physically, you can do that. And then one by one, move them onto their own Petri dishes. Um, or you can um, dilute them out in water. So that kind of takes imagination. So you have to imagine the spores. If you would take, you know, three different vessels with sterile water, put your spores in the first vessel, homogenize that, take a specific volume from that, move it into the, another vessel, there's going to be a exact amount of spores that are diluted every single time until eventually you get one vessel with one spore or you can take a drop and it chances are likely that it would just have one single spore so there's a few problems that could arise that would you know create error so if two spores were like charged and right next to each other then you could potentially be taking up two spores in the same drop you can reduce that by adding a surfactant it's called tween um tween 20 is a non-polar surfactant so that would help separate the spores um, so that's just a procedure that you could follow and then you can verify that you're getting one spore per dish just by repeating it over and over again so if you had a specific dilution you think that there's one spore per drop then you would do that a hundred times and chances are likely that maybe 60 percent of those will have one single spore so that's one way to do it you can also do something like like a PF tech or brown rice flour tech where you would inject spores directly into a substrate. So that's a different approach because um, all of those spores would be competing against each other. So it's not going to produce an ideal environment for the fruiting bodies. Um, it, the, but it will produce a strong fruit because it's kind of like survival of the fittest. So over time, you're going to have many different phenotypes competing for the same resources, and then one of them will fruit. That's why um, everybody says when you, you know, with what I do with 90-second mycology, the 90-second rice, it's tailored right for beginners, and, you know, they're always going to get a spore syringe, and they think a thick black syringe that's just full of spores is the best to have. But they don't realize that then you've got all of the different the different strains competing once you actually inoculate the grain, even if it's not 90 second rice, even if you're going to take the spores anywhere else. You have all these competing strains that it can actually end up just slowing stuff down. And I think I think, Gary, you brought up PF tech. Correct me if I'm wrong, but do you say PF tech out of like kind of the understanding of, okay, there's an assumption that most spore syringes are going to have some sort of contamination within them? Um, so it depends on the concentration of the spore syringe. Okay. So if you have a really dark spore syringe, yeah. and you're going to have a higher chance of just having more contaminants. So Triple I think flakes. it's almost beneficial to take that syringe, dilute it out, at least, you know, a couple standard deviations so maybe dilute it twice and then make a syringe from that dilution and that will cut down your contamination you know triple fold from that original syringe and then you would also have a backup culture um, or a backup stock solution and okay. then you can you know instead of inoculating one pf tech you can inoculate 20 of them with the same volume same amount of spores but larger volume of water and that would allow for more variation to happen too is so i there, think there's benefit to diluted spores um is there any evidence for contamination binding to spores because it's like in my mind the contamination say in a syringe for example like within that mm -hmm. volume of area the contamination is homogenous throughout it or is it kind of bound to the spores because if it's homogenous, diluting it in a way, is that just 
sort of like hoping that it's more or less than the like the, I'm sorry that's not a proper way to speak but mm. the amount of spores is greater than the amount of contamination and so by diluting it you'll get a higher chance of just getting the spores um yes but also even if it was highly contaminated and you diluted it enough out where one cell was per one drop of water you could do a hundred plates maybe 90 of them only have either bacteria or yeast or something but you could still get a single spore that was only mushrooms even if it's super contaminated if you did enough petri dishes if that makes sense to you absolutely and i think what's interesting to me that i hadn't really considered was the idea of getting sterile spores and that's Mm -hmm. really like kind of shifted my thinking towards it over the last few months and instead of going in tubs doing it in bags but taking that even a step further of keeping the bag as its entire little microclimate way so that it's never really exposed to like legitimate contamination in a way. So like from the time you have sterilized grains and you take sterile substrate and you combine them in front of a flow hood in a like aseptic way, theoretically, if the fruits are able to produce within the bag and you're able to get spores from those fruits in front of a clean environment in front of a flow hood, theoretically, shouldn't those spores coming out be clean and free of contamination yeah and that brings up a really super exciting concept if you watch that hyper breeding video if you can replicate what you just described so an aseptic fruiting technique in vitro you can aseptically take that mushroom the sporocarp that's releasing spores and attach it to a lid with like vaseline and put it over a liquid culture so that way you're Mm. really stirring up those spores in a hyper three-dimensional space and if you do it really well and it's sterile then i think that there would be benefit to that Um, another option for hyper breeding is getting a spore print diluting out the spores and injecting those into uh, a liquid culture and i think that that's the future um I'm definitely going to do a big project as soon as I'm done with this one and just see how much variation would happen because that kind of leads me into this discussion. So there is there is a, a question to be answered about the, the dominant traits in mushrooms. So there's a paper um, that came out called, that describes what is called the Bowler Effect. And... The purpose of this paper was to figure out if mushrooms have just a random, you know, spontaneous mutation and then they randomly trade traits over time or if there's um, a dominant trait almost like, you know, um, in mammals like the like fur color or something could be dominant. So. They figured out that mushrooms do, in fact, have stronger affinity towards certain genetics. So this is kind of important because that makes um, the single spore haploids more valuable because if you did randomly have a, a sterile mushroom that was releasing spores into a liquid culture, and that carried one of those dominant traits, then most of those spores would be from that heritage. So it'd be much harder to get recessive traits than if you isolated those spores out onto agar, figured out which one actually carried the traits for a recessive gene. Um, so that they discovered that the Buller effect is true when mating mushrooms. So that could be a downfall with the the liquid culture phenomenon, maybe there's not as much variance, um, but I haven't done it enough to kind of make my decision on that. But it, it's a cool concept to think about. And then there's this other concept that arose from that experiment called diamond mating. So that is when there's um, diploid mycelium that can connect with a haploid and the the diploid will spontaneously donate some of its genes kind of randomly so in a in a liquid culture this might be happening a lot more than it would in nature so i feel like 
that is also going to skew the the final results of mating in liquid culture because there's going to be spores that are fusing and then because of this phenomenon they can interact with other haploids and i feel like there would be you know eventually over time just this single dominant trait that always wins yeah so i remember be... i remember seeing yep. something online where somebody ran an experiment um, instead of cloning directly with tissue culture, they were taking spores. They would grow from multi-spore each time and choose the dominant mushroom they wanted and keep taking those spore prints and growing the spores out each time from those flushes, grabbing the most dominant trait they wanted, and then eventually, finally, after so many generations of grabbing those spores, they were able to successfully get the dominant traits that they wanted without ever taking a tissue sample to agar it was all through the spores mm -hmm. yeah so very interesting that is definitely the bowler effect you know in action right there so yeah. that is one dominant trait that just gets carried over generation after generation so maybe having two different um caps that are releasing spores would help increase the variability or you know even more from different regions like I, that's just something to consider um, but yeah, so that that also leads me to the next point, which is like the differentiation between breeding for the next generation. So that would kind of be what you described with the Buller effect or with um, like cross selection and that and there's other types of breeding, which is called oh. horizontal gene transfer and that is kind of getting into the field of genetic modification, but there are a couple ways to do that. The, the daimon mating is a form of horizontal gene transfer because especially like a, a species like Foliota namico, at the end of its tips, it can spontaneously produce haploid mycelium. So like the, the um, genetic information will split at the tips of that mushroom and then if it came in contact with another foliota in the wild it can spontaneously um, transfer genetic information without even producing spores so that is something that should be studied because if there's a way to you know induce that in other mushrooms then maybe you don't even have to go to spore and you could just cross breed you know using the, that weird spontaneous characteristics which it's only in a few mushrooms that i know of most of them do not do this but it would be worth figuring out why um and then there's another form for horizontal gene transfer which is a plasmid induction so you can take specific genes kind of lodge them into bacteria to form a plasmid bacteria and then somehow you transfer the plasmids into the mycelium and there's um this paper that i i looked up it's called mini chromosomes of the blast fungus where it was a study on this mushroom so they took a progenitor strain of blast fungus and then they kind of split it up and with each of those clones they introduced different substrates and what they found was that each clone developed what they called a mini chromosome which was the genetic information that allowed it to break up that specific substrate so every one of them had different mini chromosomes which were formed from putting them on that specific substrate so then they took clones from that and discovered that those mini genes were kind of present so you can also induce those mini genes by using a plasmid which is kind of a similar structure i don't know how reliable that would be but if you used some sort of um some sort of uh more precise tool like crispr cas9 um that could be something that is very near on the horizon i'm just you know really diving deep into some of these different strategies for breeding but i think that the fact that the mushroom can produce its own mini gene just by 
absorbing or consuming a substrate and building it onto um, the the next generation, I think it would be really cool to have a history of like the strain. Like, so this one was grown on straw and then it was grown on cocoa and then it was grown on hardwood and maybe like attaching like a history of genetics to that strain could be beneficial because it's almost like attaching different like i think of it like a tank or like frankenstein where you're just attaching these genes onto this mushroom's genetics um so i thought that was really cool it's definitely worth reading this paper it's called mini chromosomes of the blast fungus maybe it could spark some knowledge and someone that knows more about um, genetic manipulation than i do or you know, maybe it just leads to some more conversations. But imagine what we could do the... in the future with breeding humans where people what's it wasn't it Elon Musk? Elon Musk recently said we won't even need women anymore. Or so he's saying something weird. Like you're gonna um, need we it's all gonna be humans <laughs> like made in test tubes and we're gonna genetically select see, everything think, you want. Oh, that's a great analogy though. See, I think that's a great comparison between what we're doing with spores it's like yeah, trying no, to it was like, elon oh, musk and someone else i think they came out with this they, they made a statement like it was really weird but that's a great analogy because it's like when we look at just spores like identifying what we believe to be a higher quality spore than another even if we have it isolated down to a single one that's what's led me like in my inability to do so just based on equipment like in a lab setting it's more feasible but i think like Ultimately, if we're striving towards that isolative effect, what we're going to have to employ is some sort of like AI that's able to interpret a mass amount of data and then guide its input decisions towards like with genome sequencing of like certain fruits. So like you just described, you take an isolated culture and you run it across different substrates and then you test the different, you know, genomic variations between each of those cultures. And you, you would have to create like a baseline between okay, so the same substrate still had these variations in it. So we have to exclude this, but these were all consistent. And so amongst the other comparisons of different substrates, here's what's variated amongst like their genomic sequence. And so if an AI was able to do that in an interpretive way where it was able to take, you know, thousands of samples and say, okay, here's what's the, like the concluding factor. So you take a billion spores and you put it in a syringe where, a machine's able to intentionally extract one of those spores if it had the, de the determinative effort to say, okay, this one will be better for this sort of effect. Like, I think that's the only way we'll get it down to, towards that sort of understanding because our, our lifetime is limited based off of like how much data we're able to accrue and kind of put into effect. And when we're working with just one spore to one spore, like the amount of like physical labor that's currently involved in getting it down to that point and working it in an effective way versus like just throwing massive combinations out there and throwing it outside and bringing it back inside to try to get a better effect. But then the, like you were saying as well, like the tool set that it brings, like it represents a different tool that can aid us in a different way then. And so like kind of by combining these efforts, hopefully we'll establish a better way of understanding them and like developing new techniques techniques in an intentional way rather than shooting in the dark and kind of seeing what sticks like i think you better start start coding get your python skills going to get the ai so like, scripted i think that like that's the brilliance of where we're at right now with technology like we can specialize in such a way that like there's somebody out there that is so devoted to ai development and coding and production but the issue is that like the layover between like hobbies and interests like it's going to take somebody in the mushroom community to find somebody that's really good at that and introduce them in a way of like hey look at what you can do with your skills in this area in this marketplace and that's what i like about capitalism in a sense is that it promotes that sort of like free market drive and incentive towards bringing over different skills because if everybody's just designed to do a certain thing like we might, like, I wouldn't be able to develop the best AI. Like if I spent the rest of my life doing it, like that's not where my talents and skills like lie. And even with like mushrooms, it's like, just because like I've been putting in time and effort towards getting better at it. I don't think I will ever be the best mycologist. If I spend the rest of my life doing it just because it's like, there's somebody out there with a more like guided and talented 
approach towards it. And they've been doing it for longer in a, and in a better way. It's like I had a, a coach that said, like, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And it's like a really important distinction. And it's like I'm practicing so imperfectly that hopefully it leads to something like new and innovative in a way that will give somebody else a tool later on to like employ it. But it's like trying to recognize that within ourselves is hard, like trying to find what it is that we're good at in the same way that like each spore is good at a different thing relative to how we judge it, you know? That's my story. So I know, so we've been going on about breeding, lots of great ideas. Should we, should we do a Q and A? Should we start taking questions from people directly in the chat? Get more involved. And I've been trying to pull a giveaway winner, but for some reason in a live, it's not letting me pick it. Like if we were to end the live. And pull oh it, it, yeah, maybe uh, the, it's only with comments that are posted. Vote? What if we let the chat vote on somebody who's been like helpful or good in chat? and they deem good or do you just want to you want to post your giveaway in your discord with your bot and send people there we could totally do that or go to go to his discord react to the bot post and then you get your petri dish yeah absolutely normally like i've done it before on mine and it might be because i'm not host of it that it's not like giving me access to the comments of the video or something but oh maybe yeah, we'll set that up for next time and we'll do like a live giveaway in chat. But right now, you guys decide on how you'd like to do it. I'll give it away to somebody. I'll ship it. Make sure it gets out there however you want it. That's how we do That's it. We up. do it live. We work everything out live. Every technical difficulty <laughs> live in real time. Yeah, stuff comes up. It's like and life adaptability like that's what ultimately dictates survival right because same with the mushrooms it's like their ability to like overcome freaking contamination like there's a lot of analogies between them and us and how we approach it like we breathe oxygen just like mushrooms where you go <laughs> physical i don't know were you on talking about last night how we all came from mushrooms scary could have been. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or maybe it was 90. No, yeah, it wasn't so... me. I don't... <laughs> all right. You're just talking about weird. This, how we all yeah, share. Yeah, weird to think about that. Like both us They could have came from space. They right, yeah. The, from... the essential amino acids for life came from like asteroids hitting Earth. Which, you know, there could have been fungus spores there. No, that was my Ecology of Earth in Discord last night. You just said it in chat. Oh but, yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, let's, like, let's we could do a Q uh, and A, and then and then we can get things uh, and wrap it up. So if anybody has any questions, I think someone had something for Gary. I saw in the chat. I completely forgot what it was. Here we go. There's one from Chris. Can you save a stalled jar? Mm. Sterile mm -hmm. water. Inject some sterile water. It depends why it's stalled, though. Usually yeah, I was going to say, you gotta, you got to figure out why. But if it's condemned, yeah, then that's, no. the, that's the assumption. If the jar is stalled, it's because of moisture. Like, I would have thought the same thing. But what I've found, too, is that if, the, like, if it's been a while and it hasn't fully colonized, you can still send that to substrate, and it'll still fruit. And if the like if it's a moisture thing, what'll happen is that the uh, remaining grains will kind of get moisture from the substrate that you're spawning it into in order to kind kind of facilitate its production. You just run a higher risk of contamination by exposing those uncolonized grains when you go to spawn it, right? Yeah, I think I would agree with that. It just comes down to grain prep. Then what what did you do wrong? I feel like it's important to quality control so mm -hmm. leave a leave a gas blank exchange one. as well if you don't have you know people tie their lid or tighten their lids and they don't have a modified lid they go why can't my jar grow well it can't breathe and there's times on the uncle ben subreddit i look at somebody's picture and i go i don't see a modified lid Do you is it like at least loosened and they go oh no i, I screwed it down all the way with the broke boy tech or whatever you know the brown rice in a jar they don't need much air, but if you cut it all off, they tend to not react too well to that. And that's interesting, though. Different strains kind of react differently in that sense. Like, you cut off air from one strain, and it'll go nuts trying to get out of there. Another one 
will prefer to lie dormant and not be as aggressive and prolific as another. Like they've all kind of developed different proclivities, I guess. I don't know. So Gabe uh, said, um, Gary, can you give us some temps? I assume maybe because you're a commercial grower, you've worked out your temperatures in Colorado, like for fruiting and mm -hmm. colonization. That's a good question. Um, yeah. So temperature 72, um, fruiting, I kind of just roll with the seasons and, um, <laughs> but yeah, so I think that having a larger strain library so you can dial in your strain for the temperature is more efficient than forcing the same temperature into the fruiting environment every time. So it's that's what crazy. I do. It's it's kind of, uh, you know, you, you have to be really on top of your scheduling. But yeah, I rotate through my strains as the season develops. So I definitely got some winter ones and then some summer ones and kind of all season ones. I have the book, the Paul Stamets book, Growing Medicinal and Gourmet Mushrooms at Home. And it's crazy the parameters for a lot of these gourmet mushrooms are they want like cold temperatures, like 60 something degrees, I think I saw for, uh, I, it's kind of outdated now. But the chestnuts that we see today are not chestnuts that are listed in that book now. But the parameters for those, it was like 60 something degrees. And I'm like, who's running a fruiting tent that cold for mushrooms? <laughs> yep. Yeah. So especially like enoki mushrooms, uh, king oysters, I'm doing 58 degrees and yeah. blue oysters too. They, they come out really nice blue. It brings mm -hmm. out some of the features like the caps on the kings will get that really nice like zebra effect. So colder temps are cool because they grow slower. They develop more morphology. But I only get that, you know, in March and April when I pull in the air from outside overnight, it'll really drop the temp. I see so a question like... from yep. uh, Voodoo Brown. It says, I'm having an issue with side pins. For my second flush, can I put my cake in a larger tub, kind of like a shotgun fruiting chamber? And uh, I would say that's like my motto. Common sense will almost always prevail. If it's side pinning, really nothing you can do. They're already there. Go ahead, throw it in a bigger tub and just let it go. I what are your thoughts on liners? Oh, yeah. So, I was, oh, yeah. I wanted to ask you. So as a commercial grower, your lighting, do you just use the bright white LEDs in your in your fruiting uh area? Yeah, I yeah, I I use LEDs. I've used T5s in the past. Um those work really well, but they're they kind of emit more heat. So yeah. I'm trying yeah, to warm you know, up the mitigate that. So I like LEDs and then I get like these waterproof shop lights so that cleaning is really easy. I'll just, uh, you know, blast everything with, I, I have this thing called the Beast. It's a uh, electric power washer. So highly recommend. Um, you could check out my Amazon affiliate. It's uh, yeah. called the Beast. And I pull out all my blocks, spray it down with bleach, let it dry, spray it with the power washer. And then I use a shop vac and just scoop up everything. And it takes like 15 minutes to flip a whole room, which is, really efficient so um uh, you want good lighting to be waterproof i would say that's probably the most important aspect and then then you can worry about spectrums but white light works fine i do like 16 hours on just because uh, i don't pick in the dark so i'm mostly just running my lights yeah. for my own work schedule not necessarily like the ideal fruiting light I, I don't know what that is i've done 24 hours before and i I've just saw someone said good. side lighting versus top lighting since we're still on lighting yep and see that's uh, well mushrooms are they're they're not photosynthetic they're phototropic so they're going to go towards the light so i think yeah. top lighting is probably better what about like a symbiosis though see i've I've done that as well, where I just don't really pay attention to kind of the timing on the lights. But after watching the time lapses back, they're definitely responsive to the light, like in a way that they'll sometimes grow more during a dark period than they will during a light period. 
However, mm-hmm. if there's not an interruption of the two, they don't really seem to know or have any sort of baseline to compare it to. And so it's like, what if their idea of a day is like, okay, like the pin development stage, I've noticed it can change so much from even the same variety, like even an isolated variety. Um, I, I think it has to do with like the amount of CO2, but as well as the light, like if it can predict how long a day is and it says, okay, pin production is going to last us two days because we have this much water, we have this much air, and we need to get to this point in the tub to get out, or this point in the bag to get out. They, they're sort of intelligent in that way, but by manipulating their environment, by manipulating the light schedule, what if you had like four on and off cycles within one day? Could you trick them into thinking, okay, a day's happening really quick, and so you kind of expedite that growth in a way? And train it in well yeah so i brought up the lighting because gary you mentioned liners like a lot of people go oh you know lighting doesn't affect how mushrooms pin or fruit but i i definitely think if you combine a liner with a darker material you're going to see better better results in reducing your side pinning compared to mm-hmm. using just like a clear trash bag because you're going to get rid of the I microclimate think- but then there is still some light there where it's telling the mycelium like oh you know it's daylight so i don't know it's it, it is kind of subjective yeah, I think the microclimate is more important than the lighting. Yeah. Because I use a rubber band for my top fruiters and I rarely get side pins and they're exposed to. Yeah, it's in a like clear bag. Daylight. It's in a unicorn bag. Yeah, so they're always exposed to light and then they like the the rubber band is preventing evaporation on the side. Yeah. So I feel like it's forcing that evaporation and the CO2 up top. And I think more it's more important to address the microclimate than necessarily lighting. Yeah, no, I agree with but that. But that's just sure. my opinion. Um, I haven't really done an experiment on it, but it's interesting to think about. I like um, clear because you can see. So if there's contamination and stuff, I think yeah, it's better to be clear. In regards to side pinning, what I've kind of done too is I really don't have an issue with it unless I have some sort of contamination on the surface of where I'm intending to fruit from. Like if there's a tub where it either gets too dry or there's contamination on that surface layer, I'll notice it tends to prefer the sides to pin out of. And the way that I've kind of addressed that is in the past, I've recased the cake. So like it'll also shrink if it's dry, you'll get like, a good bit of clearance on each side and so rather than transferring it to another tub i would just add in a bit more substrate make sure that it's field capacity or slightly greater since it's like just at being added in as like a faux casing just to kind of restore the surface area and give it a little more moisture and to also help it trap that moisture and like with a golden teacher tub it went multiple more flushes than i expected it to because of adding that in sometimes it would colonize that extra casing sometimes it wouldn't but um maybe you could do like orbeez maybe you could do cheesecloth like i've taken like what i'll do with my bags is after they fruited once and i go to collect the fruits i'll then put it in a larger fruiting chamber so it can just be you know a slightly larger tub it could be like a tent it could be a room like it doesn't like it depends on your situation and what you have available but providing it a bigger like a bigger climate And then removing your bag or whatever tub you have it in and allowing it to just fruit where it wants to, like kind of give it some moisture to, to restart. But if it's contamination, then you might just be kind of getting into more issues. It might just be better to restart in that sense. But since we're we're still on light, I saw Voodoo also mentioned, I've heard this as well, uh, blue light for mushrooms to simulate like the shaded light out in the wild. Have you noticed like as a commercial grower, Gary, it is, have you ever changed your spectrum of light? Like, does it produce more yellow and yellow oysters or more blue and blue oysters so compared with the temperature? I can, I can only speak to cordyceps because I had, a, I had run side by side trials with just a white led. And then I did like a blue purple spectrum, definitely better pin sets, definitely a better, um, fruiting and all across the board with the blue lighting. But I think that cordyceps are pretty unique. They're usually like underneath a leaf or like they're definitely more shaded than 
let's yeah. say an oyster mushroom. So I feel like it could be a case by case. I used to use T fives that were, you know, they were more just a uh, general white light too, but I didn't notice the difference between them and just a generic LED. Um, but definitely with cordyceps, there is a difference. So I am curious about you know other mushrooms, but I think the most important thing was just um, the waterproofing. So I didn't really look into like a different like uh, the the color spectrum LEDs. They just had the diodes like basically right, just, yeah, like um, the fruit soldered, the, uh, soldered the right on plant light strips. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. if I had a better quality of those, I would definitely want to test it. But I don't know. That's a good question. So I saw um, we can move on from lighting uh, from mycology yeah, of Earth. I'm gonna throw a log on real quick. Yeah, go ahead. So Mycology of Earth had a question. He said, question for Gary about tissue culture. Can he share what the agar recipe was that he used when working for that company? Because I'm just getting into tissue culture with cannabis. Plant tissue culture? So... Yeah, he said, here, I'll, here, I'll, I'll read it again. He said, can he share what the agar recipe was that he used when working for that company? I am just getting into tissue culture work with cannabis. So, um, there's a few different media, um, recipes and it depends on the different stage of development for the tissue culture. So there's a callus media, which is going to have really high amounts of indolic acid. Um, I don't remember the exact amounts. And then after that, you go into a, um, shooting hormone. So that would be like H3. I don't remember the quantities, but um, there is a paper by the University of Mississippi on tissue culturing hemp, and they have really good baseline. We did our own, like, um, we uh, deviated from that slightly just to um, gear it towards a, a sativa. So I think we added more shooting hormones and stuff. I don't remember the exact amount, but if you look up online, there's a public paper on hemp from the University of Mississippi, I believe, that has more specific ingredients. I could dig it out um, out of my old notebooks, but I don't have those with me. But then, so you go from callus to shooting. So you have this ball and you move it on to a different agar media, and then you'll start to get your shoots. And then once those develop enough, then you'll move those onto a rooting media so then um i don't remember the the quantities of um i don't remember but i can look it up and i might do a video in the future because i really want to get into tissue culturing some conifers to do like a um, mycorrhizal mixed with a tissue cultured tree um but as far as cannabis there's, uh, yeah, definitely some public papers out there, and it goes callus, uh, shoots, then roots, and then you're going to have to acclimate them. So you're going to want to um, get like a sterile, like a clone, clone dome or something, and they're very sensitive when they come out of the, the in vitro. So you have to kind of acclimate them by adding um, air, like ventilation probably like a monotub type setup would work well um but yeah i hope, hope that answered your question good enough i'm sorry i don't remember the exact recipes i remember seeing like a long time ago on youtube somebody was running uh an experiment to germinate seeds it wasn't just for cannabis but like they were using those um like that cat litter gel that turns into gel with with like agar just to germinate seeds or something it was really interesting and that's when i i learned that you can like actually do tissue culture work with plants too it was through whatever video that was i don't remember yeah just taking some cells and getting them to regrow roots they do um like what's interesting is the orchids like i was looking at growing some orchids because i always ended up buying a bunch of orchids for 
my, wa- my mom and wife and it was just they're pretty plants but they are a pain in the ass to cultivate like i'm more interested in i don't know going with succulents or something just out of like the amount of work that they need to kind of facilitate their growth but um kind of along those lines too um with the cannabis like how long is that sustainable you know i mean does it go through any sort of senescence as well like by taking it from tissue to getting it to reroute to yeah my experience was a there was a lot of mutagens um it, it caused a lot of senescence actually so i feel like after we established these stable strains they would just grow mothers and clone from that but the advantage was we were able to really produce a wide variety right off the bat so i mean we were doing probably 300 plates of tissue culture a day and then we would rotate between strains and then out of those strains i feel like all these mutations happened that we didn't expect and it led to a wide variety more so than what we were initially going for maybe like 15 or 30 and then it produced all these different phenotypes because it wasn't very stable especially in the callus i feel Mm -hmm. like it wasn't stabilized so then we would get a lot of different shoots coming out of the same ball of tissue um and then watching those develop they would have way different traits even though they were from the same callus so Mm -hmm. i think that you know seed is probably tried and true and then utilizing like genetic testing to um weed out the males right away like that would probably be the best way to breed still at least in my opinion um the tissue culture was very it was variable it wasn't very um stable like taking clones from a mom you get the same results over and over but it was cool to do as an initial project, but it wasn't very sustainable because there was constant like things that the constant mutations happening. So perhaps it's just ahead of its time in a way. And like, I don't know, like, yeah. And I, I only did it for, you know, a short while, maybe like eight months. We, we went from callus all the way to flower and then maybe one more round after that. So, I don't I wouldn't say I was an expert at cannabis tissue culture. We did fruit out a bunch of, you know, or flowered out a bunch of different strains and it was successful. But I think that there could have been um we were looking into better vessels. Like we started off with, with tubes and then we went into baby jars and then we were messing around with some of the um there's different phylos like cube containers. So we were just tip of the iceberg. Um, I don't want to discourage anyone from trying because it was super awesome and we got really, really cool results. But yeah, it was expensive. Um, The the hormones for the agar are very expensive. And I would say the most challenging part is making, uh, pouring the jars of agar. We had to add very small amounts of these hormones because they were super concentrated after we had already sterilized the agar. So we had these hot plates that would be spinning and then we're adding like four microns of hormone and you have to make sure it's homogenous because, you know, they're tiny amount of hormone that's supposed to be in a whole liter of, of media. And it was very tricky to get good runs going um, in that regards. But I'm sure there's better ways to do it. It, it was okay. just uh, very early on in the whole industry. And sure. we, were, we were lucky to get the R&D because I think we lost money overall, but we gained all the knowledge and, you know, some of those strains were cool. So, And that's what's, in- that's what's interesting. You guys were going about it for a specific purpose and it ended up not meeting your needs, but kind of like mm-hmm. in regards to a different purpose, like it seems like there's a correlation between mushrooms, cannabis, and even us in the same respect of like that replication is ultimately what leads us to our doom in a way, like our inability to like replicate our DNA properly leads to cancer. It leads to, you know, like all these deformities that 
yeah. ultimately kill us throughout life one way or another and so, so like, hey guys this call is going to end soon do you want to keep you want to take another break and keep going or do we want to end it or it's up, up to you guys I can, I can still hang around we can yeah, take another I mean, break I, I would keep going um, yeah, okay with let's let's take I'm another break i sent the new link to the chat like we did earlier and uh we'll be back all right i'm gonna
We are back from the break. Hopefully everyone stuck around, even though it looks like they didn't. Um. Oh, I know what I was going to ask you, Gary. Um, in regards to growing gourmets, um, are there issues with selling gourmet mushrooms like lion's mane, uh, oysters to, say, restaurants or farmers markets? So, yeah. Um, we are licensed to sell our mushrooms directly to consumers. So we just do farmer's markets and CSA sales, um, in order to, you know, be, be able to sell to restaurants, you have to have a wholesaling license and that's just a different level of regulation. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, hmm. yep. So, but you know, there's chefs out there who will individually buy them, um, and, you know, it's up to them to do their due diligence with providing their customers. But it, it really just depends on your scale of your operation. So as you um, begin to sell more and more produce, then there's more and more regulations. Um, mm. So we had to get a permit for this place here. And then it just depends on the volume of mushrooms that we're selling, um, basically, that would be under the the CDPAG, which is the Colorado Department of Health and Environment. And then the Department of Agriculture um, kind of keeps track of the volume of sales. Um, and then, you know, they can come inspect us at the farmer's market, which we've met them there before. And, they're you know, they're just nice people and they're just there to make sure that you're following all the all the proper rules and regulations and procedures um how did you apply yeah. for that license was it through the state of colorado um so we went through the city and county of denver oh that and makes then sense. we went yeah. through the then you we went through the state of colorado and then also the department of agriculture so we have like three yeah. licenses how hard was that process like would you feel as a barrier to entry to somebody else getting um it? So it was, you know, pretty weird. I had to get my house rezoned because it wasn't zoned for ag. Mm. Um, oh, so yeah. that was pretty challenging, but I was persistent and I met the right people that wanted to help me. Um, probably four or five people told me like, this can't happen. And, you know, they just said no. And then I would just come back with, you know, more plans. And um, just, I found like the the applications for like uh you you had to have um like a visual representation of your house to scale and i had to find like the original blueprints and submit those and it was definitely a lot of paperwork but i knew early on that i had to have that um in order to you know properly operate so a lot that of was people my number don't one think goal about all for, of that yeah Yep. So then my number one thing was when I went to the farmer's market, I met everyone else who had gone through those processes too. So they kind of guided me and then, um, you know, they helped me to get insurance and all the, you know, things that you need as a business. And it's good to have like a network of um, like-minded people and people that have are experienced. So the people next to us, they're Dooley's Farm. And they've been selling tomatoes for like 30 something years. So they know like, you know, their network of people and then everyone's really helpful. So that was kind of like a, you know, a big, uh, I don't know. It's, it was a big moment to be able to participate in like a marketplace like that. Sure. So Denver is a little bit more progressive, I'd say like perhaps a little more willing to consider mushrooms in general, like at farmers markets, at restaurants, would you say that there's more demand out there than you're able to currently meet? Or would you say from your experience, it's pretty well saturated based off of the producers that just kind of exist in the area? So it's definitely very high demand right now. Um, I mean, I haven't not sold a mushroom in a very long time. So every mm -hmm. single week we were selling out at, at Cherry Creek, and at one point, you know, I think 
I was producing about 100 pounds a week um, at my maximum, but I like to be more around like 75 pounds, and um, that was just by myself, my own production. And uh, yeah, we were selling selling out, so our customers are you know near and dear to our hearts. So I love being at the farmers market because I get to see our uh, our customers face to face and. Totally. You know, they talk about the dishes that they make and um, yeah, it just that's it what makes I brought it... up last night. Like, would you consider a full storefront where people can just come in and they get the mushroom right off the block? They see you slice it right off or, or pull it right off. Mm-hmm. But I and then we talked about the taxes. I know the taxes are a little different than just showing up to a farmer's market and, and claiming income and all of that stuff. Yeah, so there's definitely pros and cons to that um i i don't know i haven't really decided i would love to you know have farm tours and stuff um that would be really cool i like the educational side of that because a lot of people just don't understand like where these mushrooms come from so i have to describe that which is cool i don't like i love to talk about mushrooms so it doesn't bother me but yeah having a visual and you know um a conversation would make it a lot, you know, I think it would make it better for the consumer to know where they're coming from and yeah, exactly. um, just being more, being more transparent about things. And, um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a cool concept. Um, I think that the consumer these days though, they want things very easily and, you know, we're 30 minutes South of Denver, so it's a little bit of a drive, but oh yeah, it, it's, it's peaceful and it's definitely out here and, um, I think that being in this environment is going to produce really good mushrooms. So we got a, a nice spot. It's kind of in a valley for where we're putting the building, and it gets a lot of shade, and it's by some aspen trees. So I'm going to try to uh, revigorate this aspen grove. And then my dream is to just really just inoculate the whole property with mushrooms and try to, yeah. like, give it that that – mycelial footprint that might be lacking in colorado like my ultimate dream would be if you could fly over and there would just be this green plot like in the middle of the front range (laughs) that's tight gary damn i've flown over denver many times and so i know what you're talking about there's a lot of land that seems not very well used yeah i I see a lot of chat a lot of chatter in the chat about manure right now Gary, have you ever ran manure for your gourmets commercially? Um, so I haven't personally, but my mentor and friend from Niagara Falls Mushroom, he had a whole agaricus house and he his neighbor had horses and he would just have huge compost piles. And I think he was flipping these giant steel beds like once a month and he had three of them stacked up. Um, they were like stainless steel and they had a lever that would drop down and then he would use a wheelbarrow and like pull out the old substrate and wheel it out. Wow. And then he would compost that and then um, he would have a fresh set of compost to go in there and he just used the size and the heat of the pile to do all the pasteurization. So it was really cool to see that scale of a, of an operation. Um, he was picking hundreds of pounds a week and it was just him his wife and one other person isn't that what the commercial white button mushroom farmers do it's like they've got the manure compost patches and it just heats itself up and they don't even have to do anything crazy to it yeah i mean he talked about adding nematodes at some point try and get fungus gnats fungus gnats were probably the hardest um you know thing to resolve when you have that big, because it's yeah. all open, so once one gets in there, um, I think that's the biggest challenge. But as far as pasteurization, I think it was mostly just natural. Um, he said, at, you know, he also did gourmet mushrooms, so he had a uh, the uh, wood wood substrate. I think he did golden oysters, and then lion's mane, shiitake, king oyster, 
and then he steered me strongly against pink oyster mushrooms. He didn't like them. Why not? What's wrong with those? I don't know. He said that he didn't like how they smelled. <laughs> oh, wow. They're very, like, <laughs> fishy. Very that. They're That's fishy. true. I've had pink yeah. oysters that I've harvested and left in the fridge, and they get pretty fishy quicker than anything else I get, even just from, yeah. like, a supermarket, too. Once you cook yeah, it. Yeah, but I, I really like my strain of rosebud. It's kind of dense, and it's very mild, so... Is that on yeah, like, sale right a, now on the Etsy shop? Is it on, is it listed? I got a jar that is waiting um, waiting in line, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure it's sold out. Oh, man, yeah, that's good stuff, then. That's how you know. Yeah, um, it's one of my favorites. It's a strong one, and uh, I've got some some really nice oysters on the way, so I'm excited about that. I see now there's a lot of chat about tap water, water and water quality. What do you use commercially? Just tap water? Yeah, tap water works well. Um, if you can drink it and your mushrooms can handle it, that's what I Yeah, think. that's what I feel but, too. Yeah. But we live in Denver. You talk to somebody that lives. Yeah, I have a well, so yeah. it's straight out of the Rocky Mountains. In LA, oh. though, you make a different scenario. It's like a lot of, I feel like a lot of, uh, what is it? The chlorine that they add to the water could be like that's an what, issue. That, but... Yeah, there was some stuff in the chat about their their water with the chlorine. Where I live, like I live in a major metropolitan city as well, and my water is so full of minerals. As soon as it dries on a surface, it's white. It's just caked with like calcium I mean, and other stuff. We have super good like quality water here, but I will pull like distilled water for liquid culture and for agar still just to eliminate kind of the worry like with mm. grains and substrate you're kind of i don't know i sterilize my substrate so i'm not as worried about that same with the grains but i don't yeah, know if you want filter it that's the best or mm -hmm. ro yeah i see fauci uh so i saw something about casing layers and then fauci said if you case do you let it colonize back in incubation or no me personally when i've cased i just leave it as it is the mushrooms fruit right through it her Fauci and my mind went somewhere else. Oh, yeah. yeah my colleague cool of Earth talking about Flint, Michigan with that brown water. Oh Yeah, I wouldn't recommend growing mushrooms there. I'd say the other area of sterility is important is air. And you had a really good video and tip, Gary. Like, I've tabled this in my Amazon cart. You showed a video of you taking... I don't know if it was like a four or six inch air filter and you got an attachment with a HEPA oh, air filter. Oh yeah, I remember that too, yeah. And that yep. is, that's an ACE like suggestion because I was wondering how do I create a positive pressure in here and keep it clean? Because it's like, I didn't even want to create like some sort of way of getting air from outside and then trying to clean it and bring it in. But that was a top of the line solution so thanks for sharing that like just with us. yeah i don't even want to take credit for that it was one of my friend's idea but i shared it with everyone and you can check out my uh, amazon affiliate link for the the link to that and i really like that for two reasons because it's also um placed in a cooler area so when i have my full incubation it's like cooling the room and filtering it definitely I like the airflow, um, especially if you had a hydroponic tent and one of those in it. I would say that's, you know, it's going to take care of a lot, a lot of the issues that, um, yeah, beginner people have. So then it's just down to you and your hands and staying, you, you know. You got to narrow it down. Yeah, just not over the Petri dish. That's 90% uh, so of the problem. On the other end of the horse, like on growing like food that the horse can eat, like, do you ever do any experiments where you reintroduce like spent cakes into a soil or try to grow directly, like plants directly off of it? No, I compost everything after a couple flushes and I use these big black tumblers and it, they just turn into dust basically like. You'd oh. be surprised how fast uh, mushroom blocks can compost. It's like a concrete mixer, but for compost, you yep. keep it. You can yeah, like yeah. spin it around. 
yeah, and I'll put my uh, my my food scraps and different yard debris, and then mix it all up, and it gives you really nice um, like hummus soil. And I do a lot of gardening, so I'm gonna set up some more raised beds, and it's just a constant source of nutrients for for fertile soil. Yeah, that's interesting because I've seen uh I've seen a morel project where they um they were doing like it was like a father and a son and they were doing the slurry tech. I don't know if you've seen it, but it was like a it was a pretty big video getting shared around and what they would do is they found this area in their yard that was popping up morels. And so they would just take the morels and they would eat, you know, 80% of them, but with the the runs of the litter and the ones they didn't really want, they would kind of blend up in a blender of water. Oh, I remember then, this it in a bucket of water and they'd go around their yard and they would dump that bucket of water all over in all sorts of different spots and then they showed it you know six months later and everywhere they kind of dropped it there's all these morels popping wow. up and it's like for whatever reason their yard was conducive to it but it's like that kind of encouraged the idea of okay maybe with liquid culture or spend cakes i could kind of break them up outside in environments that may or may not be suitable for it and kind of return like you were saying well, let encouraging to succeed you had sort of i don't know i guess more more altruistic intentions with like saving the environment mine was more so to be able to go back and find mushrooms there at a later yeah so so one day i'm going to buy an old uh pesticide sprayer truck like one of the 500 gallon trucks and i'll just fill that up with (laughs) liquid culture and then just spray the hillside (laughs) Dude, that's, that's a great idea. idea. Hey, you see those trucks as non-potable water for like to keep the dust down during construction and stuff. Yeah, load, little load up culture. one of those. I could see something like that if they tried to reinforce like I don't know cannabis restrictions, like growers just taking mass seeds and dumping them everywhere, and they're just popping up all over town. Like, but that's the different thing about mushrooms is like the quality is kind of maintained like throughout that like if they're gonna grow like a mushroom's gonna pop up there it's still gonna be just as good as the one you grew in your or, or oh is here's here's something interesting hazel malone said curious to know if there's any potential for introduced mycelium to act as an invasive species or mess with existing ecologies anyone know if there's any research into this mm-hmm. so i have an instant that i could recall um, someone sent me some spores from New Zealand, and I had a couple people reach out who were concerned, and I reached out to a couple reputable mycologists. So this is just a he said, she said, but <laughs> basically they told me that what are you gonna grow it on? And I told them I'm gonna try Masters Mix, and they're like, yeah, it won't work. And then I tried it, and it didn't work. So I feel like it's very specific to that niche. But that being said, that, you know, stranger things happen. But I think that spores can travel across the ocean. So if there's, you know, intermingling and I feel like that's just part of nature, too. Like you can take spores on your shoes and bring them to a different yeah. country. And that's all if, part of the if it adapts, it adapts. <laughs> Yeah, wasn't it, it Paul Stamets? He said he would bring spores, like they would scrape spores on his shirt sleeve or something, and take them on a yeah, plane. Like spore to... prints on your yeah, shirt. On, yeah, on his clothes, so that and he'd fly back with them. Yep, that's clever. Him. So what else? Yeah, that's going on? nature. It, it like out out in nature just sort of happens, like where there's like a competitor will rise up if one kind of gets too out of hand, but the chance of it getting out of hand is what we're assuming doesn't happen. But like with CRISPR where we're kind of like inducing unnatural things, like that kind of is a worry in the back of my head. Like what if in a lab we, we get some spore to be highly prolific for the sake of like a gourmet culture, but it gets so prolific and gets to one of these areas like Florida, you know, where you have a hundred percent humidity for a good extended period of time. And it, and it uses that to eat up the walls of houses, you know, like it's just that kind of. Oh, <laughs> I love those posts on Reddit. Like it'll be someone's bathroom with like mushrooms growing out of the shower tile. And, and they go like, and spread it. Uh, and they're like, like oh, what is this? Can anybody identify this? <laughs> I feel like just yeah, 100% humidity. 
Yeah. I think at one point the earth probably looked like that. Yeah. Maybe that's happened before and that's I don't know, that's humans came in, it was the human intervention and we just the mushrooms are like, What the hell are you guys doing? We were here first. <laughs> yep. Everywhere yeah. under under the soil. Oh, Gary, how do you feel about spores directly to liquid culture? Yeah, we talked about that. Just but in general. For like the people talk- that didn't, yeah, for the people that didn't listen, yeah, I really enjoy the concept, but I think it might not produce as variable of results as I might think initially. Um, but I think that if you dilute them, they have a better chance and... I, so far in my trials, two out of seven success, so 20%, it, it easily gets contaminated. So I, I know, um, did you ever see what they called the Capri Sun tech that was going around? Where there's a specific, <laughs> there's a specific um, brand, well, a flavor of Capri Sun. It's pretty clear. It's like Pacific Cooler. So what people were doing was they were taking their spent spore syringes and sucking up this Capri Sun, and it would germinate the rest of the spores and create a liquid culture in the syringe. And then, of course, you know, they would go to inoculate grain with it right away, and sometimes it would be viable, sometimes it would be contaminated. But then, now, um, so people want me to cover that, because, you know, 90 Second Mycology is all about this weird stuff, like Uncle Ben's and all that. So now the company is switching over to foil bottoms, and they say it's a supply shortage of plastic or something, and I'm like, it, they had the clear bottoms. People were shooting spores in the Capri Sun. And what I was telling people was, I guess it's not bad if you're using the liquid culture pretty much to germinate your spores. But then you still, you don't know if it's clean or not. So a lot of people that are getting into it, they don't realize that they always have the question of what's the benefit of agar versus liquid culture. You can't really see contamination in liquid culture. So if you go shooting spores into liquid culture, not knowing what's going on, it, it can germinate the spores, sure, but you're still going to have to test that on agar. Yeah, think, always test it. I think the nice thing about agar is that you have the ability to kind of separate the two if you have an issue with contamination, like in a spore syringe or a spore swab or a spore print. like Or like you're saying, Sam, it's smuggling them in on his shirt. Like That had to bring some contamination, but he trusted enough in his ability to separate the spores from the contamination but that begs another question too is like in liquid culture i don't know i've seen your videos gary you you can point out pretty quickly like if something's contaminated in a liquid culture or not like not necessarily so i'm gonna i'm gonna put out a video tomorrow i think where i show some examples of why you want a quality control because i had this shiitake culture look perfectly good but then it contaminated so it's uh it's contaminated in, like on agar on grain or stuff? on agar i test all my liquid cultures on agar and for that reason so i'll put that video out tomorrow um yeah i, I feel like bacteria is easy to spot it'll get turbid and it will smell weird but in a capri sun my thoughts on the capri sun is if you wipe alcohol where you're you're withdrawing the liquid from it should be fine and then make sure the needle is sterile and i'm pretty sure that they have to have sterile like drinks it's fda certified so yeah somebody wanted to claim that like the uncle ben bags aren't sterilized in the factory and i'm like the usda would not let food that's packaged to eat leave a factory that's not pasteurized or sterilized especially with drinks or canned food can't yeah, like if you if food. you call the company, you can probably be like, "This is my lot number. Uh, what's the sterilization date?" And they'll tell you. I found mushrooms in my Uncle Ben bag. Like, what happened at the factory? The issue is like <laughs> yeah. proving like their liability because if it was punctured throughout the time of like transport, if that yeah, someone at the like, store could have messed with it. Or even the procedure of getting whatever culture you have into the Uncle Ben's bag, perhaps that's overlooked and like this, yeah. this being an issue with Uncle Ben's. So. But, what I want to get into more on the channel is like more fruit juice LCs for people, you know, like the Capri Sun Pacific Cooler flavor has been tested working great for tons of people. They'll even just cut open the Pacific Cooler Capri Sun, 
dump it in a jar and pressure cook it. And there's a pre-made liquid culture that's sterilized for you. Straight yeah. apple juice, you know, it, it's high in sugar, sure, but it works. And see, I've probably oh. made over 100, 500 mLs of like liquid culture, and maybe 5% of them have been visually contaminated. But everyone that wasn't visually contaminated, like even if there was maybe six or seven that were contaminated on agar, but I didn't find that until after I had already inoculated a bag. And so I kept an eye on that bag. And what I found was that it was still able to produce fruits in a way. And so it's like, what if there's some sort of like homogenous contamination in a way? Like, what if the liquid culture kind of puts it through a testing grounds of sorts? Like if there is contamination in there um, and it's able to, and the mycelium still able to thrive, perhaps as long as it's not harmful to us, it can mm -hmm. cohabitate in a way that doesn't require separation like throughout every step yeah there are uh mycotoxins that can occur though so hmm. i would definitely recommend you know discarding that just because there could be harmful um byproducts from contamination like molds yeah. or even like e coli or salmonella Trichodons. you don't want to totally. consume that so Absolutely. i think sterile is best um that's coming from my perspective um, there are some interesting concepts using contamination to produce like mm -hmm. antibiotics. Basically, I know Trad Cotter was working on a patent where he introduced um, specific contaminants like uh, MRSA at a hospital, and they would have this mushroom bag with a specific patch, and then it would cultivate an antibiotic, and then they could in real time like this person has sepsis so you culture out the culture put it against the mushroom the mushroom produces an antibiotic for that and then they reintroduce that into the person's body and that's a really cool concept um i don't know how far that's gotten but he just talked about that at the telluride mushroom festival a few years ago and i thought that was mind-blowing um, yeah yeah so definitely there is a so much opportunity with mushrooms right now and this whole industry is growing and i love um you know talking with you guys and um just uh yeah i look forward to the future innovation and more videos i got some videos coming out soon but um i think i'm probably gonna start wrapping this up soon i got it's yeah, getting it's, like, we've been going for really uh, cold in here i gotta be going for three and a half hours time we got a lot of info wow. out there but we're always down to do it again we Absolutely. can hang out on each other's and channels gonna, anytime gonna have to come here sometime and uh we'll chat it up absolutely fellas it was a pleasure yeah Thanks so um we'll see you guys next time